Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Fashion Network. Um, in this open discussion, uh, we are going to be looking at the gamification of fashion and the future of digital outfits. Uh, just a few things, though, before we begin, just a couple of things to note. Um, if you have any questions or comments, then uh, please leave them in the chat box. Um, we want to keep this uh, discussion as interactive as possible, so please do get involved. Uh, alternatively, if you prefer to speak rather than type, then you can actually um, click on uh, raise your hand feature. I think it's at the bottom of your toolbar, toolbar at the bottom of the screen, or it's part of my screen at least. And if you put your uh, if you put your hand up, it'll allow us to turn your audio on, and you'll be able to speak to us directly. So you've got two options: you can either type in the chat box or you can put your hand up and you can speak to us directly. Uh, however, this session is being recorded. So if you do speak to us, your voice will end up on our YouTube channel at a later date. Speaking of which, uh, for all of you that registered to this uh, via our Eventbrite page, uh, you'll get an email uh, around afterwards with a thank you from my colleague uh, Mia, and there will be a link to the recording in case you wanna listen to it again, or you wanna share it with colleagues or anything like that. Also, immediately after this session, uh, we will be hosting a sort of post-webinar uh, debrief and sort of virtual networking session. You're more than welcome to join uh, myself and the rest of the panel at that. Uh, it's only been for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, so that'll be immediately after this session and there will be a link posted in the chat box towards the end of this webinar. I just want to say thanks to our two partners today. So this session has been supported by uh, Gameopolis. And Gameopolis are a um, games industry network uh, representing the video games industry here where we're based up in Manchester in the UK. Uh, and also Aressa.co.uk, who are a UK based executive search and growth consultancy. So that's uh, our two partners. Um, the one thing I would like to ask all of you out there listening is if you could um, just test out our chat box for us and let us know uh, what it is that you guys do and let us know where you are in the world. So just if you could just check uh, in the chat box, um, let us know where you are in the world and um, let us know what you do. Um, yeah, so you could just type that in the chat box. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping rules, I wanna say. Um, just a quick introduction uh, from myself. So I am Dale, I am one of the founders here at the Fashion Network. Um, and I will be chairing today's session. Uh, we have brought together, basically a bit of an experimental session, if we brought together two quite different industries. So we've got uh, game people on the panel from the gaming industry and people on the panel from the fashion industry. So we're hoping for kind of an interesting conversation. Uh, joining me, we've got um, some really good speakers. We've got Stephen, Olga, Ian, Zofia, and Anusha. Uh, and Stephen is head of publishing at games developer Radical Forge. He's also a director of his own consultancy company called Steve, Hey Stephen Hay, and he's also on the committee of Gameopolis. Alongside Stephen, we have Olga, and Olga is a chief sustainability officer at DressX. And uh, DressX is one of the largest fashion multi-brand store of digital collections from um, most of the well-known brands and 3D designers. Alongside Olga, we have Ian, and Ian is the CEO of Emerging Entertainment and a leading Metaverse and Blockchains game studios. Uh, alongside Ian, we have Zofia. Uh, Zofia is an international fashion reporter at Glossy. She's uh, mm -hmm. one of LinkedIn top voices and a fashion and beauty of uh, fashion and beauty of 2022, and is a sustainability and a blockchain reporter. And then finally, we have Anusha, who is head of advisory at Vogue Business. So we've got a fantastic panel. Uh, if you want to make the most out of it, guys, please do um, uh, get involved, ask questions. You know, uh, they can be difficult questions, they can be easy questions. Uh, so, yeah, we appreciate that. I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat box just to see who we've got here. So we've got uh, we've got Gabriella from New York, thanks, who's a software developer. We've got JC, who's based here in the UK. Leanne from London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, Natalie, who's a, a, a teacher's costume design in the US, uh, Jackie from Essex here in the UK, hi, uh, Ian, um, who's from the UK near Reading, from anyway, so, uh, Jasmine from Washington DC, uh, Ben from Vietnam, so we've got quite a, a wide display of people here, 
uh, we've got a multi-vendor marketing uh, marketplace uh, for wardrobing. So guys, got a fantastic audience here by the look. So um, hope you all enjoy it. Hope you all get some valuable insights out of it. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to uh, throw out my first question. I'm going to come to you, Stephen, first, if you don't mind. Um, you're obviously well rooted in the games industry. Can you just give us uh, your thoughts on what the current opportunities for fashion brands within sort of current gaming worlds are, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities. A lot of people doing um, partnerships with, with fashion brands in 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 various ways. You know, I think The Sims was one of the first kind of games really that started to to work with fashion very kind of seriously you know and they've worked with um a lot of the 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 big people you know h&m and and um people like that the more kind of mass market brands but then you know over down to people like lacoste and, and burberry uh who have been in games in uh minecraft even animal crossing had um had a crossover recently and i, I think in a way, there's there's there seems to be a lot of opportunity in in that kind of you know surfacing fashion and surfacing brands. Um, how deep that goes and how you know kind of I think that's where the the, the magic for, for me comes to when we start really thinking about what what we can do rather than just you know just kind of showing um, outfits off uh, and using it as a kind of a showcase or a you know a catwalk. And I think Epic now, who are one of the biggest game companies in the world, who you know make make the 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 game the software that a lot of people make games on and in, um, they have a head of fashion now. So obviously, I think we are just starting to. It's it's kind of it's very early days, I think, for what we can do, and and a lot of the the stuff that you see is very is in the AAA games. It's in the uh, you know the the big games like Animal Crossing and and Minecraft. These, these are a big kind of AAA games, and uh, The Sims is by EA. You know, so they've got lots of resources, and and um, they they can kind of accommodate these. I think what will be interesting is when we we start seeing kind of indies move into this space, so bigger indies. And when I'm talking about indies, it's kind of um, the independent games companies, which can still be big companies. They can still be, you know, two, 300 people companies, but those, those bigger companies are less well-resourced. So they don't have people, you know, going out, finding them brand partnerships and stuff. Um, but often that's where the real creativity is coming from in, in the industry. And, um, and I think when you start partnering that creativity up with fashion, then I think, we we have the potential to do more interesting things i think well let me bring one of the fashion representatives on this panel and i see anisha you were nodding away there when stephen's speaking uh, do you want to add anything to that um yeah i mean i thought what you were saying about the indies coming into play was was really interesting and for me it's not just from the perspective of the game developers but the independent or smaller fashion brands as well i mean what i find so fascinating is Usually when you look at digital spaces and more established um, platforms like Instagram or YouTube, it's really expensive for brands to actually achieve a valuable presence that's going to convert into sales for them. Whereas for me, some of the most innovative brands that have been experimenting with the metaverse and with gamification are not necessarily the biggest brands. And so there have been some really exciting activations from smaller brands like Marnie, or even independent brands like Joshua Kane that really show that this universe gives opportunity for smaller brands that might not be able to compete in those bigger expensive environments to actually cultivate new audiences and broaden their reach through this brand new space. Uh, Zofia, uh, did you want to add to this as well? Um... Yeah, I think that it's also just the breadth of different platforms. Like at the moment, obviously the focus is primarily on the kind of gaming environments. If you're talking about something as big as Fortnite, um, but you also have, you know, all of these online kind of web three platforms and also the ones which are more catered to Gen Z. I mean, Roblox has been such a major winner for fashion brands over the last year or so. I think that that's something that has really grown um, and it's kind of like small brands to major brands because of the, 
flexibility that they have when it comes to partnerships. It means that they can choose what level of investment they want to go into um, on these platforms, whether it is just creating, you know, one garment or whether it's something like PacSun who built out like a whole little mini kind of world on the platform um, and have really kind of delved into world building as a brand. Um, Ian or Stephen, uh, for that matter, what would you say is the most obvious world or most exciting world, gaming world for fashion at the moment, would you say? Who'd like to pick that? Ian, do you want to, you've not said anything yet. I'd say it's a really tricky one to answer. I, I would agree with Stephen's thing about we're in such early days. No one's actually really materially made it work. And, you know, certainly there's so many companies shouting about having a metaverse and everything, and they've got very few players in them. So the big names that we discussed are probably the biggest players, you know, your Fortnite, your Roblox, and um, all of those those places are where, where I think the biggest sandboxes may be, like they're, they're the places where I think things are going to work for now. And I do think uh, Anish, Anisha's point about it's quite difficult for brands to invest big money into it and get get anywhere near the returns unless they're being able to PR it and use it as sort of marketing to show their innovation. It is tough. I think one of the biggest things is we forget how recent things like avatars are in games because mass multiplayer has not been around. You know, before there's no point having a fashion item in a game that's a single player game where you don't meet anyone else right and people forget that they, they're just like oh we want to have avatars it's like unless you're going to have friends to meet in that game there's no point showing that off so and that's not that old uh so i do think it's just a uh, on its evolution for now well it's interesting because i want to talk a little bit about the business uh, opportunities for both gaming and obviously both fashion businesses but before i do that i just want to ask olga i want to bring you in in terms of obviously you're producing uh, you're producing these assets at the moment where do you like to see your you know your your foots your labors live in what sort of worlds and what sort of platforms do you like to see your garmentry uh, being displayed yeah, well, uh, we produce for multiple platforms. So first of all, we say that ourselves is the is our avatars for the social media. So when we say that we produce garments for for the photo dressing or for a yard dressing, we're basically wearing our avatars for the social media, which looks like us. Uh, so this is the, the very first platform. And then, yes, of course, we, we discuss Roblox, we discuss Decentraland and uh, Ready Player Me. All, all these spaces um, are very popular right now and uh, the interest is um, is growing. Like, uh, I don't know, in the end of last year, there was um, a report about the growth of the Roblox and it was saying that it's a very promising uh, platform for the fashion brands. And we see that, we see how many fashion brands and even luxury fashion brands entering Roblox. We also see the Decentraland with the Metaverse Fashion Week, which which is going to be like next week. And there are a lot of brands preparing activations there. So I think uh, we just need to understand what is going to work best and what's used best. Uh, and I agree with Ian that the industry is so new. It's so young. We have, it's very, very beginning. So we, we just need to to see how everything is uh, developing and where we're going. It's really exciting, actually. Yeah, it's, it's really timely to be doing this webinar at the moment, actually. But um, Ian just touched upon, uh, you started talking a little bit about the business uh, opportunities and stuff. And I might go up to Stephen again on this. But um, what are the business opportunities for sort of businesses like your studios, like yours? And, and also, if you can give us your perspective on what the opportunities are for some fashion brands as well, because I'm we cover a lot of this on in our editorial and our content. I'm still somewhat confused about this, but can I get your thoughts on that, please, Stephen? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, so I mean, there's, there's a really good example of the company that I'm working for right now. We're working on a wholesome game, it's a multiplayer game, and um, we know we can kind of skin the characters very easily, you know. So, when I mean skin the characters, I mean kind of put them in outfits. Uh, give them accessories we could you know brand them up um so so it seems to to me like an indie might go okay so let's um let's maybe 
you know, talk about doing some licensing or, or um, working with some some brands to to use those skins and to to put in kind of you know fashion packs or whatever. Um, however, I think what we what we need to do as game makers is work out well how can we do that. How do we make that more meaningful and how do we make that more kind of how do we create links outside of the game? Because you know what 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 does it matter if if HM give us a whole load of clothes to to brand our our characters up, especially when you know we haven't got the the, the size of game like the Sims, for example, where it becomes this uh, you know an advertising or marketing channel. So I think we kind of uh, I think there's a responsibility and a, a, a not a pressure, but I think the indie dev world needs to kind of work out how do we do things which are more meaningful, which allow um, maybe fashion brands to create more of um, a link with consumers uh, over a longer time, you know, to kind of live with something over because games now are, are not, you know, they're, they're increasingly less, just a product that you buy you play for a bit and then you you don't play again they're kind of living worlds now and they become seasonal you know we have different things going on in them uh, the environment might change um you know how a new challenge might might appear and this is what people want even in wholesome games so it used to be that you know it was just about these games that you go in and they're first person shooters or they're kind of um games which are about you know where you can do strategic campaigns and now games like animal crossing have shown that actually well people are uh, kind of will play these more wholesome games where there is less of pressure on on gamers to you know to kind of uh trudge through tasks and do things on time and to beat the clock nice kind of relaxing games um and this is, but they, they, those players still want this this seasonal content and still want things to change. Um, I've I even forgotten your question now, Dale. But the other <laughs> thing I was going to say was that there's the the kind of opportunity I think when we we do start talking about the the metaverse, and if you know one definition of that is where well, you'd have one character or one representation of yourself digitally that then can move to different uh games or entertainment products um and these companies like um avakin uh avakin oh, but, sorry playkin who um who are creating you know play Playkin's just got a whole load of investment uh i think like last year they got like two and a half million i think to build avatars that will move between games so you create your avatar and then you have that and that becomes this kind your of character the next question um, <laughs> to move up around games and in different kinds of games. Sorry. So um yeah, so so that's my kind of ramble. Uh I don't know where we started, but that's hey, that's some work. I was just gonna jump in, like Stephen just talked to, uh, about community. Two things that I think are really important are completely agree that games and fashion now it's all about communities and all about that stuff. And then the second thing is when we talk about metaverse and NFTs and all that and everything, and for players, it has to be really meaningful value. Everything you do needs to improve the experience. So, you know, in NFT world, people are like, it's just a JPEG. So you've just got to be asking yourself, well, what am I going to deliver that's valuable? So there's some really cool things you can do. Like you can have, um, discord channels that are only available to people with a certain nft that are an exclusive club to be part of and we see the loads of that in gaming so it's like own that asset not just because of the image but what access and what it can give you and i think that is a big lesson for fashion it's like you know and fashion has always done that really well so i, I would just say value and community are massively important when thinking about this stuff um i want to go back to that avatar thing uh but before I do, I want to bring Anusha back in on this. So obviously I was getting Stephen to talk about the opportunities from the games industry, but from your point of view, Anusha, what's your analysis of the opportunities for fashion brands from a business point of view? You're on mute, by the way. Yes, this is a big unmute, Anusha. Um, 
Well, Sophia, I'll come to you while we get a new show off mute. Can I bring you in, Sophia? Sure, Nick. Oh, you're, you're off mute now, Misha. Do you want to bring up and I'll come to Sophia next? So, oh no, your mic's gone. Oh, yeah, your mic's gone. You might have to log in and log out again. I'll come to Sophia and we'll try and sort that out. Sophia, do you want to, do you want to take that question, the business opportunities for fashion brands? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that from a business standpoint, you know, fashion has been expanding into various different um, arenas and kind of silos. I think it's been integrating with art and it's been, you know, collaborating with musicians and various albums and labels. So in a sense, this is kind of like the next step. Um, I would say that ever since the campaign with um, Louis Vuitton and Final Fantasy, I was kind of aware that this is going to be a really massive opportunity. Um, and as someone who also plays Animal Crossing, I think that it is definitely an opportunity in, you know, alternative games. Um, and that business opportunity can simply be, you know, either advertising in-game and designing outfits. I think what's in really interesting is actually mixing those physical kind of advertising opportunities with the digital. So not just focusing on keeping it within that digital world, but also linking it to out of home advertising um, or perhaps something on the brand e-commerce. Um, and I think one of the brands that has done that really successfully with Roblox is um, Forever 21, who until relatively recently were not doing brilliantly in physical. Um, they shut down a lot of retailers and they had a whole massive rebrand. Um, but they launched a unique kind of hat in Roblox um, and then actually produced that hat within their stores. And it's been a consistent kind of seller for them. So if you're looking at something which is, you know, product related, that is a really good shout. Um, I would say it's still very much in the early days when it comes to brands who are mixing that advertising into kind of out of home. I'd say Fortnite and Balenciaga was a good one. They had a massive dog that was out on you know, 3D billboard screens out in Piccadilly Circus. Like that was something that people actually related to the game um, and they could kind of bring in, you could buy the hoodies. Um, so I think it's just more about expanding that um, idea of what a brand can be across both of these spaces rather than just thinking about one. Uh, Stephen, can I bring you back in on this about this avatar stuff or, or Ian, it's either one of you could pick it up. Um, because of, you know, obviously nobody wants to be able to change avatars between different platforms and all that stuff. And you've obviously got AAA gaming worlds and you've obviously got the world of social media and all that sort of stuff. So talk us a bit about the technology and where that's going to go. You know, can you have multi-platform avatars? Um, who'd like to pick up on that, Ian or Stephen? You know what? I'm really sceptical about this area, right? So because it sounds a great concept of like, oh, I'll get to wear my same outfit in all these games. But if you're a games developer making this stylistic game that you spent years developing, it's all in its own world and everything. And then you got all people just rocking up in different outfits. I'm not sure like I completely buy it. Uh, and also there's a hell of a lot more to the engineering of games and the rigging of characters and everything that you can just whack on a sort so I think it will work in some games, but I'm not convinced you're just going to be able to teleport your, your, your outfit onto everything. I think more you'll get like real success in social media platforms and places where you have profiles and places that your avatar, your pick appears. And then in some games it will work. But even in the ones I've seen right now, they always still, you know, they'll have a... Uh, an aesthetic to their their game that they'll want you to adopt. They don't just want you to try and pick something up. But I don't know what you think, Stephen. Yeah, I think and the, the different kind of uh, like character shapes. So not all, all the games, you know, we're not all humans in Animal Crossing. Definitely not humans. Um, uh, we can be all kinds of, kinds of things. That's one of the great things about games. You can inhabit kind of anybody you you want really. So I think it'll be interesting how it plays out but i think that kind of ties into how the whole metaverse will play out you know and this thing where will these avatars be representations of us or will they be representations of um you, you know kind of like an abstract version of us like like the animals in in his dark materials where there'll be these things that they'll kind of 
well they're, they're, they're not you but they're they're kind of like your your soul or whatever your kind of playfulness um so it'll be kind of quite interesting but yeah i i i completely get what you mean every game has a different aesthetic and you know new aesthetics different looks of games are one of the main marketing selling points of of a lot of games when when they when they you know kind of hit the market so um so it will be interesting to see how companies like play can do um on the other hand i think there's there's probably more opportunities in that in that kind of the sims space because we've got the sims 5 coming out which um, you know, fashion has been so important to the. the I, I love The Sims. I'm completely, completely biased when it comes to that game because I think it's amazing. But um, and there's, so that's coming out, and they know how important fashion is to that audience, to that group of players, and so it will be really interesting what what I'm sure they are already doing with with brands to to implement into into Sims Five. Um, at the same time, there's another game called Life by You, which is coming out, which is kind of like the first real proper Sims competitor in terms of scale, um, which is coming out. That's made by a company called Paradox. And that I think that debuts in September, towards the end of the year anyway. Um, so so while the, you know, the, the, these kind of indie opportunities, I think there's, there's going to be more AAA opportunities as well so and a triple a that's what i'm talking about these big big games launched by people like ea cool um if you guys got any questions can you pop them in the chat box rather than the q a because we're not monitoring the q a uh on this uh, session so just pop them in the chat box and also try and do it so that everybody else can see and read we just find that makes um makes the whole learning experience uh, a bit more valuable for everybody. Olga, just one last question on the avatar stuff. Do you have any thoughts on sort of cross-platform avatars? What are your thoughts on that? Well, we all talk uh, about interoperability and it goes also to the question of when we have an NFT and, uh, and utility and community. So um, I think that uh, it's really cool for some use cases uh, to have this interoperability when we can use one item and we can replicate it all across different like metaverses or game environments. Uh, and there are some, some cases or maybe some brands which won't work just because of the aesthetic or something else won't, won't be working. But um, I think that these interoperability is still very important. And like I say, it's connected to the utilities and communities. And because if we're doing the um, NFT drop and we provide the utility for as many platforms, gaming environments, metaverses as possible, we can hit different targets. And there are some uh, audience which prefer to go to the Roblox and there are some audience which prefer to stay in the Decentraland and they all want to buy the NFT and to, wear, to, to have this NFT, but they want to have a utility in different spaces. So in this case, we have to think how we can um, create this interoperability to cover as big an audience as possible. I'm going to come on to the NFT thing in a minute. I'm going to bring Stephen in on this because I know he's got a little bit of a gripe about it. Um, but I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat box, a couple of questions here. There's one question here from Helen. Do you see the metaverse as an opportunity for people to network globally or do you just see it as just a game? Well, you could argue life is just a game, but um, who'd like to pick that question up? Well, I, I have I have some example to, to share with you. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to the uh, NFT gallery uh, guide uh, guided tour uh, to Spatial, and it's been like maybe a year since I I've been there. I didn't like the aesthetic, the previous aesthetic where you have just half of the body of the avatar, and I was so surprised how they. Um, developed their space and right now you have the chat where you can actually talk to each other and where you can have even the small um, icon with your video and everyone can see your face yeah it's small but still everyone can see your face and uh i told to my friend uh from like even other country even other continents so let's go and visit this nft gallery together because i like the artists they're cool i was on the uh, guided tour and we meet at a certain time we agreed in that gallery 
we had to we talked to each other not typing but actually talking with our mics like we're doing today and it was really cool we like basically like catch up and we haven't seen each other for, for some time so i think that certain metaverses and certain like spaces can provide us the tool to to network and to provide this global community to build people or to bring people together uh, there's another interesting question here from Kata. Um, it's quite a long one. So if you, if you guys can keep your question a little bit short, it just makes it a little bit easy for me to read out. Uh, but could you talk about new customer segments? I am researching a digital fashion and I'm very keen to understand the customer more. Obviously, the gaming stroke tech blockchain crowd is very different from the fashion crowd. So comms towards them must be adjusted. Is the gaming crowd different to, to the fashion crowd? I don't know. Um, who'd like to bet? Um, there's a head mod in there on Ian. Do you want to do you want to take that one up? Um, I would definitely say that. Well, I, I read the question. And I was like, it's definitely a different crowd, and I think definitely. actually that's probably why some fashion uh, activations have fallen really like have, have, have fallen foul and not really worked. Um, and I suppose the only answer to, to it really is that you've just got to really segment and look at that that audience and really understand it and not just walk into a new game and expect that your brand, just because it's really well known, is going to do well with that audience. So I don't know if that helps answer it, but I just think it's like they are different communities. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I think Sophia. I can add some things. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the things that I do um, in my job is about talking to brands exactly how they're doing these kind of things and marketing is one of those um, reaches. I think that in some senses, Web3 came about at the right time and Metaverse at the right time because it gives an option to tap into this, maybe not gaming crowd, but someone who's, you know, interested in technology, interested in exploring kind of um, new digital spaces while at the same time potentially being interested oh, I think we've lost you. I think we've lost you, Sophia. Um, yeah, we think we've lost you. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick welcome back to Anusha. Anusha, do you want to just... Um... So, um, a replication of how things work in real life and therefore advertising and branding is kind of integral to that. Um, so I think in, in, it kind of depends on who they want to target and making sure that you're thinking about who your customer is in each of those things. And yet there have been a lot of fashion brand activations that have failed because they've been thinking about, you know, web two audiences versus web three and gaming audiences, you know, all three are separate. Thank you. Uh, Anusha? Say, sorry, Dale, just to, just to add that the sorry. gamers are a, a, a one size fits all either, really, you know, so you've got such a spectrum of different games and such a spectrum of different gamers who some are in, in it, you know, are very competitive and some are in it for an, an escape or a distraction. And there's a whole world in between that as well. So I think my, being very careful to match, like you were on TV, you wouldn't just go, oh, there's, that's the, the TV crowd or the cinema crowd. You pick specific genres of films and TV and the same with games as well, I think. There has to be some crossover as well, surely. Um, gamers wear clothes. So. Well, yeah. Some <laughs> people that wear clothes play no, games. That's, that, that's insight for you. Not always. Not always. <laughs> Anusha, can I welcome you back? Can I just test your mic? Is it working now? Yeah, I've had to claw in from my phone. I'm so sorry about that, but hopefully this will be... A, a fine alternative for purpose no problem we'll keep our fingers crossed i'll just um a couple of questions in chat box here there's one from gabriella um what software tools does one use for fashion in the metaverse would it be 3d modeling things like c4d and after effects does anyone want to quickly answer that i think olga can answer that is it? yeah sorry uh, could you please uh, repeat the the, uh, the question i didn't hear the second part uh, what software tools does one use for fashion in the metaverse? Would it be 3D modeling like C4D and After Effects? Um, well, first of all, you have to start with the digitizing of any garment you want to create. And well, 
in uh, at DressX, we use usually Cloth 3D, and then depending on each metaverse, I think, yeah, you have to adapt and go to the low poly items. Yeah, there are people who are writing Blender browseware. Browseware is like Cloth 3D, yeah. So this is kind of the, the tools and um, you have for after effects. Yeah, it's, after, yeah, it's basically after effect. And then, um, yeah. As, cool. as many as you can to improve and to add some effects, uh, animation, etc. But basically, yeah, the first one you have to to start learning and to understand it at the cloth 3D or browseware. Okay. Um, comment here from Helen. I'm part of the Adidas community. I think it's super clever brand placement as gaming is one of the biggest industries. I mean, I've always often thought about that sportswear, <laughs> sportswear market in particular, making use of the whole gaming thing. Um, I'm going to move on to NFTs because there's, there's a couple of comments and questions in the NF, in the chat box about NFTs. Um, Stephen, I'm going to come to you on this. What is this controversy around NFTs in the gaming world? Can you clear this up for me? Um, I can't clear it up. I wish you could, but the, <laughs> there's been you know kind of wholesale rejection really of of on uh, mass because I think it kind of. I think NFTs came along at a time when also there was a lot of cynicism towards um, big gaming companies anyway, kind of uh, trying to find ways to monetize their, their players within games. And so it really kind of hit a, a bad time that, okay, here's another mechanic. And people just thought, well, this is a way of monetizing me as a, as a gamer, really, and, and not to get any, you know, to, to squeeze more money from me. We've very little value for me. And so it's become a real kind of toxic word in in games. And any one, uh, I mean, we were talking before this, and Ian mentioned that a few people have kind of tried to implement NFTs. You know, a few big big players have kind of gone, here's our NFT policy, and the backlash has been kind of extreme online. Um, I think what will happen is. Um, we will have NFTs. I think they 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 will happen, but they won't be called NFTs. They'll be introduced in with different wrapping, uh, in a different way, and I think they will be really good for games, or could potentially be really good for games. I think if you combine NFTs with user generated content as well, so that's when people are making them things in games for themselves, which is becoming increasingly. Um, important and increasingly um, a, a, an activity within games, then you you get the opportunity for people to make themselves money in games as well. So um, so I think it will happen, but it will be called something different, and it'll be you know the the, the pill will be sweetened. Anybody else want to add to that? I um, just can't. Um, I just want just to confirm that Steven said about this uh, uh, thing that in gaming environment, people doesn't like uh, NFT communities and there is like uh, some clashes and some conversations that these uh, uh, crypto people come over to our environments and trying to take off our um, spaces and using uh, games for their utilities. Yeah, I just want to say that it, it's all true, but, uh, and probably, yes, we will, prepare the NFTs in some different wrapping and some different names to be able to accept by the gaming community. Anusha, did you want to say something? Yeah, I suppose taking it out of the, the pure the gaming environment and what the uses are for, for fashion companies, there, there is such a range. And so I think for me, it depends on what that purpose is going to be. Is it just a, a reward or a feature of a game? Or is it something that helps to integrate that experience across both the physical and the virtual realities that those um, users um, exist in? You know, the, the idea of um, POAPs or um, proof of attendance protocols, that type of NFT or an NFT that um, unlocks different loyalty um, incentives that kind of takes you slightly out of the gaming mentality and, and more thinking about what your experience and interaction is with a brand beyond the, the gameplay itself. Maybe maybe we are thinking about this in such a binary way, gaming, fashion. I mean, maybe there are, there's a lot of more similarities than there are differences about this whole topic. I mean, I mean, I've always, I've someone that's actually worked 
within the games industry and the fashion industry is a lot i've noticed a lot of similarities a lot of, a lot of it's about self-expression a lot of it's about tribal identity all that sort of stuff there's a really interesting comment actually um in the chat box from sadia uh, metaverse has avatars that do not look like human bodies and then how we can find out about how they look like on the human body or on us in the in a virtual environment how a garment will look like on the avatar body now this is quite interesting because um there is this middle world, isn't there? Social media and stuff like that, where you could argue that actually some people's bodies and faces and what have you don't look exactly like they are in the real world. Now, it's kind of, and you could even argue the whole premise of fashion in the real world is about, you know, expressing yourself and making yourself look different or, or whatever it might be. Let's talk about that middle world. Let's talk about that kind of AR thing. I'm not sure who I'm going to come to first on here. So if anyone wants to wants to um, jump in, feel free. But let's talk about the opportunities and that sort of middle world of AR and sort of like the social media platforms. Who'd like to pick up on the sort of opportunities? You know, it's not pure gaming. It's not pure fashion. It's that kind of social sort of. Um, I might I might bring you in on this, Anusha, because you've been out a little bit, but. Have you seen anything, uh, any interesting developments in that kind of like within AR and that whole middle sort of like um, not quite gaming, not quite physical fashion? Yeah, I mean, we do we do a lot of research on AR. We're going to be doing a lot more of it this year. Um, but there have been some really interesting insights that have come out of that that show us that probably the utility of AR goes beyond what we thought about when we initially started using some of these tools. So most people when they think of AR they think of it as an immersive experience or an immersive way to experience a brand or a product we found that there are that using AR might take you into new audiences or new communities so for example really good AR that might help your help customers experience your product when they're not able to access it physically for example in a cross-border situation um, disabled shoppers as well. I mean, it, it removes a barrier for shoppers who might not be able to go to a physical store and try on a product um, in a changing room because the facilities aren't available to them or they don't have the mobility. Actually developing AR to remove a pain point for that community is, is a really interesting use of it. And there are also categories that are more advanced with, with AR um, than others. Actually, I think apparel pro probably has so much opportunity, but the technology still needs to develop to make sure that the rendering of fabric is as accurate as it possibly can be. But when we look at things like hard luxury, so jewelry or watches or cosmetics, things that you might not always be able to try and for hygiene purposes, actually there's there's a lot of use cases for AR in, in that way. Um, and I think probably the fashion world could look to some of those other categories for inspiration on how to do it well. Anybody else um, on the whole AR thing? Um, Stephen, what's your thoughts on on AI? I know I'm not sure of how involved you guys get in this. What's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I was really helping you. Um, wouldn't ask me now. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> well, I can we, move um, on if you like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's not really um, it's not really a thing. That kind of you know AR XR. The, there's a lot of kind of potential there, I think, um, but it, it's not something that I've ever been hugely involved in, to be honest. Okay, well, I'll move yeah. to Ian. It's all right. I actually would agree with Stephen that basically that Pokemon Go happened and everyone went, oh, my God, there's going to be like a game every week like this, and, and it didn't happen. And um, and it didn't happen because AR on your phone is a bit rubbish because it destroys your battery and it's actually not that fun to to do and hold. But I do think this year could be a massive leap forward if Apple released their headset as is uh, expected at the back end of the year, because that is going to solve those two things. There won't be a, it'll be on your head, uh, won't be a battery issue. You'll be able to see it in the room. I see that as being like a really key moment for AR to jump forward. And I do think it will represent massive opportunities for fashion if that happens. Uh, and, and based on all the leaks, it looks like it's going to happen. So. Let's try and bring a few more questions in then. So I've got a question here from Roshin. As a knitwear designer, I use Shima Shaky, is that the right way of saying it? Design software with their Apex system. Where can I make a program file for a knitted structure or garment and it can be digitally simulated? Then the panels are stitched together to create a full 360 garment. Can anyone answer that? Um, 
just nod or shake your head if you can. And if you can't, and I'm sorry, Roshi, <laughs> we'll move on. Um, well, let's have a look at other questions here. Uh, there's a question here from, I noticed from uh, Mo, I think. Do you think the Asian countries in particular are leading on the exploration of fashion within the digital world? She mentions uh, the Shanghai are holding a digital fashion showcase. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Um, where in the world do you think that this is happening as Sophie, you've just come off mute? Yeah, I've got um, a lot to say. I mean, I'm very interested in kind of Japan digital fashion culture. So um, I would say that, you know, the growth of um, digital avatars like influencers in China um, has just catapulted that whole market into a whole new thing. A lot of people have, you know, digital kind of um, avatars and alternatives to their real self. They spend a lot more time um, in digital worlds most of the most popular games out there probably created from you know games coming from nintendo um or other kind of japanese creators who have made it their that kind of thing um i think in in terms of the metaverse i'd say that most of the products are more us slash european based but in terms of kind of digital fashion and adoption i think in most asian countries whether that's china or Japan or any of those have a kind of easier time with adopting those kind of technologies. Um, the whole kind of rise of QR codes and all of that was very big and adopted very quickly over there. Um, over here, it's still kind of taking some time. I think a lot of people got a lot more comfortable with it during the pandemic. Um, but I think that that's something that, you know, is growing exponentially and therefore it's influencing what's happening, you know, either in Europe or in the US. You mentioned the pandemic there, actually. Um, there was a comment or question in the chat box a little while ago about, do you think the pandemic has actually really sort of forced or encouraged the fashion world to embrace the metaverse and the whole digital thing? Um, who'd like to pick that up? Yeah, I can take that again. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so I think that a lot of the fashion industry was kind of stuck when the pandemic started. You know, so much of the interaction that we have with buyers with photographers showrooms fashion weeks it all happens in a physical space and while there's been some digitization um you know fashion's notoriously slow with adopting technology um it took a lot of the biggest players very very long time to even start an e-commerce store um so i think that once the pandemic happened everyone jumped on it because they didn't want to lose out on the business opportunity so there was designers who would shift their um, catwalks to, you know, um, digital ones. Um, usually that would just mean, you know, a recorded show or something like that. But it came about in other innovations as well, like trade shows, which are basically where people get all of the materials and things. Um, that is something that shifted online in a big way during the pandemic. And while it has returned somewhat to in-person, there's a lot of kind of integrations now that carry over between tech and fashion um, rather than kind of just being focused on in-person interaction. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, can I just on, uh, jump here course. and talking about uh, the pandemic and the shift in the fashion industry, well, DressX, Fabric and all these digital fashion houses, they came up as a result of the pandemic and because people wanted to create the content and, for example, at DressX, we provided that solution instead of like going outside, which, uh, well, basically wasn't possible, you can reuse your previous photo sessions and change them and update them using the digital fashion. So this is uh, the first solution which we introduce as dress access digital uh, fashion retailer to the, to the users. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of comments uh, and questions, Stacey and Andy talking about the sort of carbon footprint of all this virtual activity. Now, someone that doesn't know this subject very well, I'm thinking um, this has got to be a good thing, but it, I might be completely wrong about that. Olga, I know this is your area of expertise. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and about sort of like the ethical and sustainable aspects of AI? Yes, really? definitely. Yes, 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 definitely. So, um, yeah, there is a perception that uh, digital space metaverse is not sustainable because of the carbon footprint, which is associated with a lot of uh, energy use. Um, so in terms of the digital fashion and the production of the digital items and skins, um, 
actually we showed the dress acts that the production of digital goods emits 97 percent less carbon footprint in comparison to the production of the physical goods and uh during the production of the digital items we don't use any water and in average for the production of the like cotton t-shirt we need about 3300 liters just for, for one t-shirt which is enough for one person to drink three and a half years if he drinks a two liters so this is in terms of the production and when we were talking about how digital fashion can help like um, traditional fashion industry and in general to decrease the carbon footprint i'm just saying that let's shift to the digital space and uh, and this, uh, introduce this digital ownership. So if you want to, do, to to have a new piece of garment or a trendy piece of garment, you just use digital instead of physical because it will decrease the carbon footprint. In, uh, if we're talking about the metaverse, uh, well, introducing the, first of all, the Polygon and Ethereum uh, switch to a uh, layer two solution, Ethereum, uh, uh, release the new version like in September uh, in September last year so all these helps to decrease the carbon footprint from the minting NFTs by 99% so um, and because everyone was concerned about the carbon footprint of the NFTs and minting and using the Ethereum platform so right now we are on a good path to be more sustainable to decrease the carbon footprint but what i'm saying as a chief sustainability officer it's for the for each creator for the each brand or uh fashion house to have to control what they're doing to like uh calculate on like quarterly basis their carbon footprint and see if there are any ways how you can decrease that um anusha do you have any research or have you done anything on this in your line of work i mean if you haven't you haven't uh... um yeah i guess i think the consumer research that we do I, I just don't think that consumers are there yet in terms of thinking what the impact might be if they're engaging with these environments they're still trying to figure out what their impact is if they're buying clothes in the physical space i think that's that's actually still a nascent conversation at industry level never mind at the consumer level but also i mean it's relative right where we spend so much of our time online, we spend so much of our time using our mobile devices, we spend so much of our time, if you're gamers, in that gaming environment anyway, it seems a little bit unfair to create criticism just for the metaverse specifically, when actually it, it's relevant, you're, you're engaging with all of these spaces anyway. Um, but I think it raises an interesting question about regulation as well, that the infrastructure for the metaverse and for gamification fashion, whether it's the legal infrastructure or the technology infrastructure that's evolving to, over time we'll find efficiencies, but over time there might even be requirements to do things in a certain way that do limit the impact. I just don't think that we're, we're there yet in developing that, that framework. Okay, um, well, we're into our last 10 minutes and there's a couple of interesting questions in the chat box. There is somebody in the chat box asking, was there any stats to uh, Olga? to what you were saying if, if if you do great share it if you don't then uh be great but there is two interesting questions here about one uh can a wardrobe stylist in the real world cross over into the gaming industry as a consultant that's something i asked one of your colleagues many years ago Stephen. um i forgot his name now but he used to work he worked on jet set willie which was a game i was massively obsessed with okay that. i was a little bit starstruck because any time i've ever been starstruck about anything but um <laughs> it, 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 but Tell me, what, what, do you, what do you think? And, and anybody else can uh, answer this one. Yeah. Um, so I think right at the moment, I mean, you know, the, I, I mentioned that uh, Epic have um, have, uh, have now have a fashion director. They're, they're probably the, the, the kind of people spearheading things like this. I think at the moment, you know, uh, kind of the wardrobe department of a video game company is a concept artist who would kind of create the look and feel for characters in a game. Um, I think the, the amazing thing about the games industry, you know, I've been in it for a, a few years and the, the, there's so many jobs now that didn't exist um, in the 90s, you know, when I came into the industry. So I, I think not yet, but I would, but I would, but if somebody said, introduce, you know, I was in a, a studio and somebody introduced me to their director of fashion or whatever, I, I wouldn't fall over. I'd go, of course, of course you are. <laughs> 
because it well, makes total sense. And there's another comment or question here about what we'd be interested to know what new roles we might find in the industry. I'm sure there are going to be plenty. Um, I have got, so there's, um, just to let everybody know that uh, we are having a little bit of a post networking session after this, and there's the link in the chat box. So you might want to just copy that um, before this session gets closed down. And if you've got any further questions, you can ask that in, in the post networking session. It's just a normal Zoom meeting. So what we would ask is if you do join us, if you could switch your cam on, or at the very least, uh, ask questions via mic. Um, I'm going to ask my last few questions, and I just want to ask uh, both sides of, I don't want to say the debate because it's not, but I want to ask the gaming guys, and I want to ask the fashion guys, what the metaverse means to both communities. So I'm going to come to you, Ian, first. What does the metaverse mean to you and to, to sort of the gaming sector? And I'll come over to um, uh, one of the fashion guys. Not. Um. I just think it's about this trend for more and more of our time is spent online in every sort of place. And, and COVID did kick that on, but it was just a trend where we just, we're just spending more time there. So from a fashion point of view, it's just normal that people will want to represent themselves more in that, those worlds. And, and, you know, that's why they're doing it. Um, I mean, the word metaverse is not right because there won't be one. There'll be lots of different places that people are on. Um, and within that, not only will there be lots of different places, but there'll be different levels of immersion. So at one end, you'll have like really high definition VR, which will be like the most premium version of being in the metaverse. And in other versions, it'll be like being in Roblox. And that 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 to me is like, but it's, uh, essentially all it is is just people talking and communicating and playing you know online together that's how i see it and from the fashion side of this discussion who would like to pick that up what does the metaverse mean to the fashion sector who would like to pick can, that? I, sure. can i take i'll take yeah, this of course, first, yes, okay ahead. um i mean on the one hand fashion consumers have always had a, a higher propensity to engage with novelties and this is new and it's exciting and we see fashion consumers being much more engaged with what the metaverse is and it, the possibilities of it compared to other categories but i think from a business perspective it's not too dissimilar from developing a business strategy in the physical world i mean the metaverse represents an opportunity for new product development. It represents an opportunity to acquire new customers, to re-engage existing customers. And I could see a world in which the metaverse represents a permanent channel in an omni-channel operating model, which is no different to the way you would normally conduct business. So it's an extension of what, what most businesses are already doing. So, so we're looking at kind of omni-channel fashion whatever that or whatever fashion will end up being basically it'll be on like like we, you know it's not just selling the physical product it's delivering that because right? i mean arguably fashion the one thing we learned from the last uh, session that august spoke on is actually one of the speakers there was saying that his son spends more money on his digital avatar outfit than he does on his he just walks around the streets in his jeans and tees and and you know you can say arguably fashion always has been this form of self-expression and it's, in the digital world is just allowing us to express that even more to even more audiences across the world um it's very interesting we can go on forever but i'm going to go a quick spin round now and i'm just going to get everyone to sum up and where do you see the future of sort of digital fashion going so um anusha because anusha because you've spoke last or you've got the mic do you want to just give us your thoughts on where you see digital fashion going in the next five years or so sorry do you want me to go first yes um, if that's okay yeah, I mean, I, I do think that we're going to see much faster adoption. I think tools are becoming more democratized and easier to use. Um, I think attitudes are changing really quickly now and brands are starting to see the relevance of having a metaverse strategy as part of their future plan. So I think this is a year to watch because we're seeing the culmination of, of all of the groundwork that's been laid. Um, and it's going to be a really exciting time for fashion as a result. Thank you. Um, Ian, what do you think the future of, sort of digital fashion will be? What's your thoughts? Oh, um, just more, more, more representation of people's brands across all their channels, basically. And um, people starting to flex their fashion items more in the digital world than they will in the real world. 
Yeah. So it's that omni-channel thing, really. Um, I'll come to you next, Stephen. What's your uh, thoughts? I think more kind of more meaningful interactions um, than than we have at the moment. I think we fashion brands, people like, um, and and also this kind of creativity as well. I think so, um, Nike kind of announced dot swoosh. I think recently, which is seems to be kind of a, a creator economy kind of thing. And I think if we can bring that into games as well, then that could be really exciting and meaningful. Fantastic. Uh, Sophia, I'll come to you next and then I'll finish off with Olga. So, Yeah, I definitely agree with Stephen. I think that the prospect of kind of building out brand worlds and how brands can leverage those creator communities and get more involved with those, possibly also kind of passing on or releasing some of that IP so that people can do more interesting things with brand imagery. Um, I think that that's definitely something that's happening right now. There's a lot of kind of tense conversation between brands and creators, um, but it could ultimately lead to more collaboration between the customer and the brand, um, which could pose a kind of another idea for what the metaverse could be. Fantastic. And Olga, you can have the last words on this. Where do you see this? Yes, uh, it's it's very interesting question. And right now it's a Paris uh, blockchain week. And we had an event uh, with uh, Decentraland in the preparation for the Metaverse Fashion Week next week. Uh, next week. And we were discussing this topic just this morning where we're uh, going with the fashion, digital fashion um, and all the use cases. And the discussion was that as much as we like metaverse and as much as all this metaverse provides us an opportunity for the uh, international, for the global communication, etc., people would like to spend a little bit less time in front of the computers, but still they want to, uh, to use these digital fashion tools. So that means that we need to, to get to the technology where AR will be more uh, achievable and with better quality. So it probably not only with the, your smartphone where you can dress your uh, AR on, on your body and uh, record a self, um, a self or something like that. But when we have actually tools like glasses, uh, which allows us to see each other wearing different digital fashion tools. So, um, so to sum up, we think, uh, I think that we have uh, to push, first of all, the technology, which allows us to uh, enjoy the digital fashion uh, more and in better quality. And then it will become a very natural part, uh, a very like, usual part of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you all for contributing uh, for this. It's been absolutely fascinating. I could just carry on and carry on asking loads of questions around this. I do find it really, really interesting. It really does question the heart of what the gaming and the fashion industry actually does and what we actually deliver. So huge thank you for that, guys. Um, the, like I say, we're just going to have a virtual debrief and networking session. If my colleague can share the link again in the chat box, that'd be great. Uh, you're more than welcome, I'm talking to the audience now, you're more than welcome to join us afterwards. So just been myself and some of the TFN team and our panelists for about 10, 15 minutes immediately after this. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, and I shall see you in the breakout room. Thank you.